It's January 1973, and Lester Matz is sitting behind the wheel of his Cadillac, driving through downtown Baltimore. The streets are full of couples, braving the bitter cold and making their way into upscale restaurants and bars. Matz wishes he could join them, just park the car, throw on a warm jacket, and find a dark lounge and a stiff drink. But Matz can't waste a single minute, not after the notice he just received from the federal government. Matz is the co-owner of an engineering company in Baltimore. Over the last decade, his firm's done well. They've gotten a steady supply of lucrative government contracts, and Matz has overseen road construction projects all over Maryland. But apparently, his company is now the target of a federal inquiry. Matz just received a subpoena from the U.S. Department of Justice. The feds are looking into kickbacks paid to local officials in exchange for government contracts, and they're demanding to see Matz's business records which is a problem because Matz hasn't exactly run a clean operation for the last few years. This investigation poses a risk both to Matz personally and to his entire firm, which employs more than 300 people. But what the feds might not know is that their probe could have larger consequences. If they dig deep enough, they could inadvertently target one of the most powerful men in American government and cause a national uproar. It could even set in motion a constitutional crisis as federal prosecutors might be forced to bring criminal charges against Spiro Agnew, a man directly involved in the Baltimore kickback scheme and the current vice president of the United States. Matz has to get Agnew on the line and warn him about the developing investigation. So when he spots a payphone next to a gas station, he pulls over. Matt steps into the phone booth and shuts the folding glass door behind him. Then he drops a couple of coins in the slot and dials the number of the vice president. Vice president's office, how may I direct your call? I need to speak with Mr. Agnew, please. May I ask who's calling? Matt hesitates. He just realized that by talking with Agnew's secretary, this conversation is going to be logged and turned into an official record, creating another layer of risk. But Matz can't afford to wait. Yeah, um, it's Lester Matz. Oh, hello, Mr. Matz. I'm afraid the vice president is extremely busy today. Can't talk at the moment. I know he's got a packed schedule, but this is an urgent matter. Is there any way I could speak to him tonight? You'll have to excuse my asking, but could you give me some details? We have a lot of urgent calls around here. Matz's mind starts to race as he tries to figure out a cover story. Well, it's sad news. A mutual friend of ours in Baltimore just passed away. Oh, dear, I'm sorry to hear that. That is tragic. I apologize for being crass, but again, the vice president has a very full schedule. Sometimes personal matters just have to wait. Oh, I I understand. But look, I can be quick. I just wanted Mr. Agnew to hear the news from me directly. We were all quite close. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Matz, but the vice president's time is quite limited. If you can just give me five minutes. And you promise it won't turn into a longer catch up between old friends? I will be brief, I give you my word. Agnew's secretary hesitates for another moment, but finally agrees, saying she'll see if the vice president can't sneak away for a quick call. Matz is put on hold, and as he stands, waiting in the phone booth, he grows increasingly anxious. This federal probe could lead to a range of criminal cases throughout Maryland. Agnew could face charges. Matz himself could get sentenced to prison. A lot of businessmen and a lot of powerful politicians could get swept up. But the outcome isn't a foregone conclusion. Not if Matz can get the word to Agnew and convince the vice president it's time to start working the levers of power in Washington. Don't Panic is a new comedy podcast from Wondery that leans into our most absurd anxieties and diffuses them with humor and actual advice. Listen to Don't Panic on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. I Love My Kid, But is a new comedy parenting podcast from Wondery that shares a refreshingly honest and insightful take on parenting. Each week, the host will share a parenting story that'll have you laughing and thinking, yes, I have absolutely been there. Listen to I Love My Kid, But on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts.
from Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In the long history of American politics, former Vice President Spiro Agnew stands alone. He was accused of committing federal crimes, becoming the subject of a heated investigation. Agnew waged a bitter fight against these charges, going head-to-head with his own executive branch, the U.S. Department of Justice, and the news media. And along the way, he established a no-holds-bar style of political warfare that would influence politics for decades. And yet Agnew's story has been largely misunderstood. It was eclipsed by the scandal that began at the Watergate Hotel and culminated with the resignation of Agnew's boss, President Richard Nixon. But Watergate had almost nothing to do with Agnew's own political and legal troubles. And yet by October 1973, less than a year before Nixon resigned the presidency, Agnew was forced out of office. At the height of his popularity, Agnew was presumed to be the next Republican nominee for president. His supporters saw him as the embodiment of law and order, a man you could trust to do the right thing, a politician with the courage to challenge left-wing radicals and coastal elites. But before Agnew rose to power on a wave of populism, before the bitter feuds with journalists and backroom negotiations with prosecutors, Agnew was just an attorney from Baltimore with a growing interest in politics and a dawning sense that he could win elections and propel himself to the highest ranks of the Republican Party. This is Episode 1, How Things Are Done in Baltimore. It's September 1945, about 28 years before engineer Lester Matz tries to call the vice president from a payphone. Tonight, the sun is setting in Baltimore, and Agnew is driving his old Ford Roadster through the northwestern section of the city. Agnew is only 26 years old and doesn't have much money to his name. But even driving around in this beat-up old car, he's feeling good about his future. Agnew just clocked out of his job at the law firm Smith & Barrett, where he works as a clerk trainee. Now he's headed downtown to the University of Baltimore, where he's been taking night classes and studying to become a lawyer. Agnew is highly motivated, with a strong sense of discipline. He's been that way ever since returning home a few months ago, after serving in World War II. He was only 22 when he was drafted, but the war forced him to grow up fast. Agnew went on to command a tank company and fought his way across France, Germany, and Italy, earning a bronze star for his service. It was a formative experience, but Agnew is relieved to be back home and driving through Forest Park, the neighborhood where he was born and raised. The streets here are lined with maple trees and dogwoods. All the homes have well-manicured lawns, and there's a golf course and plenty of mom-and-pop local businesses. Forest Park is a middle-class neighborhood made up of European immigrants who prospered in America, people just like Agnew's own family. So he smiles as he passes by the Episcopalian church where he spent so many Sundays. But his expression changes when he drives past Forest Park High School, a four-story brick building that looks like a castle and holds some bitter memories. When he was a teenager, the kids made fun of Agnew for his Greek name, Spiro. One day he'd had enough and announced he was now going by Ted. But that was just to fit in. Agnew has always felt connected to his Greek heritage. His family owned a restaurant called the Piccadilly, and it was a gathering spot for Baltimore's small but close-knit Greek community. Agnew loved seeing it fill up for the dinner rush on Saturday nights. But that all changed in 1929, when the economy crashed and the Agnews lost the restaurant. His family had to resort to selling fruits and vegetables from a roadside stand just so they could buy coal for their furnace during the long Baltimore winters. Agnew remembers the day they had to move out of the family house and relocate to a small, cramped apartment. Agnew cried inconsolably that day. But his father, Theo, gave him the most important lesson of his life. He told Spiro to keep his chin up, to always be proud, and never let the world see you down. The Agnews are fighters, they'll soon be back on their feet. In the end, Agnew's father was right. And now that Agnew has a wife and a kid himself, he draws motivation from his father, a Greek immigrant who came to America with nothing, but was able to provide a decent life for his family through hard work and perseverance. But now, as Agnew approaches the parking lot of the University of Baltimore, his stomach grumbles with hunger, 
and his eyes feel like they're shutting on their own. These long days of work and night school are taking a toll. But Agnew tells himself to keep his chin up, always be proud, and never let the world see him down. Agnew is a fighter, and he's determined to build a good life for himself. It's 1952, seven years later. The now 34-year-old Spiro Agnew is sitting in a windowless office at the back of Schreiber's Grocery Store in Baltimore. Agnew's small office is tucked away in the rear. Still, as always, Agnew showed up for work in a pressed black suit with tidy, slick back hair. He's not the king of this place. He's only the personnel manager. But Agnew takes great pride in his appearance and always shows up to the job ready to put in a hard day's work even if it is dull and repetitive. Agnew looks down at a stack of employee time cards and catches a glimpse of the next few hours of his life. He's going to have to review each one of these cards and approve them so grocery store employees can get paid. It's not the worst job in the world, but it's also not how Agnew imagined his career would play out. Five years ago, he completed his law degree and passed the bar. He was eager to join one of Baltimore's white shoe law firms, hungry for the status and money a career in law was supposed to bring. But Agnew was in for a rude awakening. Baltimore is full of young lawyers with degrees from fancy schools and resumes padded with prestigious clerkships. Agnew just couldn't compete. He also has a family to feed with a wife and four children. So he began scouring newspapers looking for a job. And that's how he ended up taking a position working in the back of a grocery store. Agnew is reviewing one of the time cards when there's a knock on the office door. He gets up to answer it and finds the store's security guard standing beside a small, elderly woman who appears to be in her 70s. The woman's wearing a long black skirt and is staring straight at the floor, avoiding Agnew's gaze. Before the guard says a word, Agnew realizes what's happened. The old lady has been caught shoplifting. Agnew may technically be only the personnel manager, but given his legal background, he's also become something like the store's in-house prosecutor. He deals with all the shoplifters, getting thieves to sign confessions and legal waivers, and forcing them to repay the store for whatever they've stolen. This is one part of the job Agnew actually enjoys. He believes in law and order, and he's got a talent for dealing with criminals. So he asks the security guard what happened. One of the cashiers apparently noticed something sticking out of the old woman's housecoat and called over for security. When the guard took a look, he discovered the woman was trying to walk out with a sack full of food she hadn't paid for. Agnew nods and thanks the guard, saying he'll take it from here. When the guard steps out, Agnew reaches into his desk and grabs one of his standard confession forms. He's been through this routine many times and assumes it's going to be another easy case. Agnew explains the woman just has to sign the form, then apologize to the cashier, pay for the goods, and promise not to do it again. No one else needs to get involved. But to Agnew's surprise, the woman refuses to comply. She insists she was just about to pay for the food, but the cashier called the guard before she had the chance. She's not going to be signing any forms. Agnew cocks his head, knowing this woman is lying. She's just being stubborn. So he begins to turn the screws explaining the store has zero tolerance for theft. If she doesn't want to do this the easy way, he can always call his friends at the police station. Any charges against her will likely be reported in the newspaper, Agnew says. What will people in the neighborhood think when they read in the Baltimore Sun that she was arrested? The woman begins to squirm, and Agnew can tell he's found her weakness. He's a keen observer of human behavior and knows public humiliation is one thing people will do nearly anything to avoid. And sure enough, this threat does the trick. The woman grabs a pen and begins to fill out the form. And for a moment, Agnew savors another victory. But the feeling doesn't last. As the woman sits signing the form, Agnew is hit with a feeling of melancholy. He was meant to be in a courtroom, arguing real cases and making real money, not intimidating an old woman. But a job is a job, and Agnew knows he should be thankful. He doesn't have to steal in order to put food on the table but he can't let go of this nagging feeling, a sense that there's still much more out there and that working in the back of a grocery store is not going to be his final act. A few months later, Spiro Agnew sits down at an upright piano in his living room and begins playing one of his favorite Duke Ellington songs. Agnew's hands fly across the keyboard, striking notes in a bouncy, syncopated rhythm. 
He breathes in the smoke-filled air, a potpourri of cigarettes and pigs in a blanket. All around him is a group of friends, sipping cocktails and looking enraptured by his talent at the keys. Agnew heads toward the climax of the song, his fingers dancing. And after striking the final chord, Agnew leans back with a grin as his friends and neighbors break out in cheers and applause. Agnew won't deny he enjoys being the life of the party. And he and his wife, Judy, have been hosting these kinds of get-togethers often. They left the city just a few years ago and completely immersed themselves in suburban life, joining the PTA, the bowling league, the Kiwana Service Club, and hosting regular parties at their house. This new life in the suburbs felt like a step up in status for Agnew. But while his social life has been taking off, Agnew can't say the same of his career. He's still putting in long days as the personnel manager at the grocery store. The paycheck has remained steady, but increasingly, the job feels like a dead end. So Agnew has begun charting a new course. He wants to open up his own private law practice, but he's been worried he doesn't have a strong enough network and that he won't be able to attract the kind of upscale clients he's aiming for. So tonight, Agnew is planning to talk to his friend and mentor, Lester Barrett, who works as a senior associate at the law firm Smith & Barrett. Agnew rises from the piano and hands it over to another guest. Then he makes his way across the living room and approaches Barrett. Hey, Lester, swell to see you. Hope you're enjoying yourself. Well, I'm having a splendid time, but par for the course at the Agnew house. I must say your playing's getting better every time I come back, too. I thought that might have been Duke Ellington himself at the Keys. Oh, you're too kind. I only wish my career was moving along at the same pace. What's old Schreiber got you doing these days? Bagging groceries? Well, yeah, let's just say it's time for a change. Which is why I wanted to talk to you. I've got my eye on some office space downtown, and I'd still love to open up my own firm. I was hoping I could pick your brain about it. Oh, sure, pick away. Well, Lester, tell me. If you were in my position, how would you build a name for yourself? How do you make a splash with Baltimore's elite? Barrett sips his drink and thinks it over. Well, a lot of people might say join a country club and keep trying to make more friends. Well, that's what I was thinking. Except I don't believe that's the right advice. Now, I've talked to you about this before, but this time I want you to hear me. Why don't you take a real swing and run for office? You want me to be some kind of politician? Look, a man who knows how to work the system from the inside, he's always going to be in demand as a lawyer. Hmm. You think I'm cut out for elected office? Oh, you'd be a natural. If God put anyone on earth to kiss babies and shake hands, then I'm looking at him right now. Well, that is intriguing. But I'm a Democrat. And the fact is, the party runs this town. If I put my name forward, it might take a decade before they gave me a shot. Can't afford to wait that long. Well, the hell with the Democrats, then. I've told you this. Join the Republicans. I'll introduce you around. We're starved for good candidates. And forget about waiting around for years. I wager we could get you on a ticket by the end of the month. And once you're on the ballot, anything could happen. Agnew tips back his cocktail as his mind begins to turn with possibilities. He's been a registered Democrat ever since he was old enough to vote. But he only joined the party out of loyalty to his father, who was the local Democratic ward leader. Agnew would never admit it, but he doesn't see much difference between the two parties. He hasn't even voted since coming back from the war. And Agnew knows some of his family members wouldn't be happy if he switched parties. But he needs to do what's best for himself. And if Baltimore politics is the key to a thriving career, then Agnew's going to join the GOP. American Scandal is sponsored by BetterHelp. Right now, I'm in a dark place. It's like I'm stuck in a corner, trying to tune out the outside world, finding it hard to focus as I suffocate under a giant quilt. That is literally what I'm doing right now, trying to record this ad while away from the studio. But if you've ever felt that way metaphorically, then it might be good to find someone to talk to. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills. They can help you get out of the corner and find more productive ways to work and live. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. And if things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Let therapy be your map 
with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash AS today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, hel slash AS. American Scandal is sponsored by Audible. So I'm thinking of starting up a history book club. You know, normally an excuse to imbibe with some friends and maybe talk about a book you maybe read. But I'm going to be doing it in public and talking with experts and historians, so I've got to read the book. I'm thinking of starting with Leadership, one of the few Doris Kearns Goodwin books I haven't already read. And thank goodness there's Audible, which will not only make getting through these books so much more convenient, but enjoyable, too. Like all Audible members, I get one credit every month, good for any title in the entire premium selection, regardless of price to keep forever. I get full access to all the best sellers, new releases, and Audible originals, and the Audible app makes it easy to listen anywhere, anytime, while doing chores, exercising, or even making sure you put the book in book club. So get listening. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash AS or text AS to 500-500. It's February 16, 1961, and Spiro Agnew is gearing up for a fight. In a few minutes, he's going to face off against local elected leaders in the county office building in Towson, Maryland. They're a partisan group, all Democrats, and clearly on a warpath. They've scheduled a vote on a measure that would strip Agnew of his hard-won political power, a position that was years in the making. Almost a decade ago, Agnew took a leap of faith, leaving his job as the personnel manager at a grocery store and opening his own private legal practice. He also followed the advice of his friend and mentor, Lester Barrett, and dove headfirst into Republican politics as a way to build his list of clients. Agnew began by volunteering for local GOP candidates. He made friends with the right people, and four years ago, he landed his first job in public office when he was appointed as a Republican to serve on Baltimore County's Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board doesn't have much glamour, but despite its obscurity, its members wield significant influence. The suburbs outside Baltimore are growing at a rapid clip, and decisions at the Zoning Board can often mean life or death for multi-million dollar developments. That puts the Zoning Board at the center of some of the most consequential decisions in Baltimore County, a level of power that some might be willing to abuse. Still, as a member of the board, Agnew has developed a reputation for fairness and impartiality. He's even risen to chairman and begun toying with the idea of spending an entire career in politics. But now that potential path is under threat. These Democrats recently swept the elections in Baltimore County and now hold all seven seats as the representatives in local government. The county council has the power to appoint the zoning board, and the council's chairman, a man named Dale Anderson, has decided to remove Agnew from his position. It all seems blatantly partisan and designed to stifle a young Republican on the rise. But even though the Democrats have a supermajority, Agnew isn't planning to go down quietly. Tonight, he's going to make his case to the county council. Agnew rallied his fellow Republicans and managed to pack the room shoulder to shoulder with supporters including his allies from the PTA and the Kiwanis Club. They've launched a campaign of petitions and letters to the local paper. And Agnew is hoping that with strength in numbers, they'll be able to pressure four of the councilmen to stand up against their own party and vote to keep Agnew in office. Agnew approaches the lectern on stage and stands waiting until Council Chairman Anderson finally addresses the room. All right, this hearing is now called to order. I believe this is the largest crowd we've hosted in these chambers. And while I appreciate your civic enthusiasm, please note that anyone acting out of line will be removed. <clears throat> now, Mr. Agnew, you are allotted five minutes to make your statement. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Anderson. Council members, from my first moment in office, I have strived to serve the zoning board with integrity, professionalism, and objectivity. But apparently that's not been enough. I'm forced to wonder what crime I've committed in your eyes. Is it, is it graft, favoritism, incompetence? If I were guilty of such wrongdoing, I would volunteer to lay my head upon the guillotine and accept my fate. But it is clear to me and my supporters that the only misdeed I'm guilty of is serving Baltimore County as a Republican. Now, uh, members of the audience, please, this is your final warning. We will not tolerate outbursts. This is a council meeting, not a football game. Agnew tries to contain his smile. 
In his brief political career, he's already developed a reputation as a skilled speaker, and he can tell tonight he's gotten the crowd warmed up. Now, Mr. Agnew, uh, you certainly have a flair for melodrama, but this is not a political attack. Our decisions are based solely on the facts at hand. Well, the facts at hand are that I've built a reputation as a conscientious member of the zoning board. I once voted against one of my own clients. That's the mark of integrity. Yet you're subjecting me to this railroading, and everyone here can see it. Now, I have a message for the junior members of the council. Your bosses are not satisfied to hold the vast majority of power in Baltimore County. No, they insist on total, unchallenged control. And that's why I'm being removed. This corrupt exercise of one-party domination is unhealthy and un-American. The leadership of Dale Anderson would make Fidel Castro proud, and it must not stand. The audience begins cheering again, getting whipped up into a frenzy. Anderson shouts over the crowd. All right, all right, that's, that's enough. Enough! Let's, let's have a vote. Agnew steps back from the lectern and takes his seat. He's done all he can do, laying on the public pressure. But when the vote begins, Agnew gets a flicker of hope. Of the first four councilmen, there are two votes to keep Agnew on the zoning board. But as the remaining councilmen cast their votes, the tide begins to turn. By a five to two margin, Agnew is removed from office. Agnew supporters in the crowd immediately erupt in boos and jeers. One man jumps up and points at Chairman Anderson, chanting, Castro, Castro. The hearing grows increasingly rowdy, but Agnew doesn't do anything to silence his supporters. Even though it stings to lose this vote, Agnew can also tell he just scored an unexpected victory. This fight just transformed him from an obscure bureaucrat to a folk hero among Baltimore Republicans. They see Agnew as a hardworking, dedicated public servant, one who was crushed by tribal Democrats, politicians interested in nothing more than their own self-preservation. And Agnew agrees with the crowd's assessment. But it also points the way to a very potent narrative, one that Agnew could wield to launch himself to a much higher office. It's October 24, 1961, and Spiro Agnew is staring out at a crowd of supporters. Friends, family, and even the local press have showed up in droves. Agnew knows the announcement he's about to make could change the course of his life, maybe set him on the path to state or even national politics. Today, only eight months after being removed from the zoning board, Agnew is going to announce his candidacy for the most powerful seat in county government. He's running to be county executive, a position that's almost like the president of Baltimore County. Agnew had felt emboldened after being removed from the zoning board. And over the course of the following months, he won more and more support among Republicans in Baltimore. Still, his is an audacious move, and Agnew isn't totally confident it's going to pan out. His likely opponent is 70-year-old Democrat Mike Birmingham, who's been a figure in Baltimore politics for as long as anyone can remember. But Birmingham has also been caught in an ugly feud with a fellow Democrat, with the two battling in the primary. So Agnew's strategy is to draw a wedge between the two of them and to brand himself as a progressive crusader, a Republican willing to take on the Democrats' dysfunctional political machine. So now, looking out at this crowd, Agnew takes a sip of water and clears his throat. Then he begins warming up the crowd with a few jokes. But soon Agnew pivots, turning to a message that's certain to rile up his base. He tells his crowd that the Democrat leaders are greedy, that out of sheer self-interest and a propensity for infighting, the party has ignored Baltimore County's most urgent problems. Agnew doesn't go deep into the complexities of public policy or legal reform. Instead, he tells the crowd that there's only one way to move the county forward, the voters have to pry power out of the hands of the Democrats. The crowd gives a round of applause, along with a smattering of hoots and hollers. Agnew can see he's hitting the right chord, so he goes further, saying his Democratic opponent, Mike Birmingham, is most interested in siding with special interests rather than addressing the needs of the taxpayers. Agnew reminds the crowd about his own removal from the zoning board and accuses Birmingham's cronies of being behind that effort. And as he nears the climax of his speech, Agnew raises his voice, almost shouting that when he's elected, Baltimore County will be done with the old system of political patronage. The people of this county deserve better than grifters, gougers, and crooks. The crowd erupts in another wave of cheers and whistles. Agnew waves to his supporters and then steps back from the podium. 
Agnew believes he's done a good job branding himself as an honest outsider, someone who can bring necessary change to Baltimore County. And looking back at the crowd, he spots a group of reporters scribbling furiously in their notepads. This is all a good sign. Agnew's fiery rhetoric got the attention of the press, and come tomorrow, he should be one of the top stories in Baltimore County. It's November 1962, Election Day, and Spiro Agnew's political fate is hanging in the balance. All day, Agnew has been rallying supporters and getting out the vote. But now the polls are closed, and all Agnew can do is wait to see if he is going to be the next leader of Baltimore County. By the time Agnew returns home, the evening has gotten late. His wife, Judy, is sitting on the couch watching TV, and Agnew greets her with a kiss and sits down beside her. He wishes he could share some good news about the race, But at this point, the Board of Elections hasn't reported the final tally, and it's still anyone's race to win. Agnew is proud of his performance on the campaign trail. He played hardball with his opponent, Mike Birmingham, mocking him and challenging him to take part in debates that Birmingham never showed up to. The aggressive tactics seemed to pay off, and in the final days of the campaign, Agnew was ahead in the polls. But he doesn't trust those numbers, and he knows Baltimore Democrats have plenty of tricks up their sleeves. They always seem to come away the winners in these local races. So Agnew and his wife sit watching the local news, catching up on all the other developments from Election Day. According to the newscaster, it appears that former Vice President Richard Nixon is going to lose his bid to be governor of California. The anchor even goes so far as to speculate that Nixon's once promising political career might now be over. It's a harsh assessment, but Agnew might agree. He can't imagine how Nixon could stage a comeback after such a high-profile loss. The newscaster then begins recapping some of the Senate races that have just been called. But Agnew feels himself nodding off. It's been a long day, and a long few months. But suddenly, the phone rings, and Agnew jolts awake. This might be news from the county. Agnew races over and grabs the phone, and is greeted by an official from the Maryland Board of Elections who tells Agnew that the final tally is in. Agnew tenses up, preparing for the worst. This has been a long and bitter fight, and he always knew it was going to be an uphill battle fending off a Democrat in Baltimore. But the county official makes a surprise announcement. He tells Agnew, congratulations, he won the race. Spiro Agnew has just been elected the leader and executive of Baltimore County. It's December 1st, 1962, in Baltimore County, and Spiro Agnew is back on stage in front of a crowd. Out in the audience are Agnew's friends and family, along with some of his key supporters from the local Republican Party. There's an almost electric energy in the air, a sense that change is afoot in Baltimore County, and that Agnew, the new county executive, is about to usher in an era of reform. The historic weight of this moment isn't lost on Agnew. Baltimore County has long been run by Democrats, The party had such a stranglehold on power that some of the local historians had to comb through the record books looking for any evidence of the last time a Republican was in charge. It turned out the GOP hadn't held the seat of county executive since at least the beginning of the century. So Agnew is ready to make history and begin his first day on the job. And as he looks out at the crowd of supporters, a county judge steps forward, announcing that it's time for Agnew to take the oath of office. Agnew smiles as the judge begins the recitation. This isn't just a historic moment for Baltimore County. It's also one of the great triumphs of Agnew's life, the culmination of years of hard work and sacrifice. Along the way, Agnew had to navigate a system mired in corruption. In Maryland, and especially in Baltimore, politics are a dirty game. Political bosses and their organizations wield enormous influence, often deciding who's going to come away the winner in a local or state election. And to curry favor with these political kingmakers, there's one essential mandate. You have to pay up. People in Baltimore even have a special term for these handouts. They call it walking around money. You have to pay the political bosses for everything, from sample ballots to the salaries of poll workers. And of course, these aren't the only costs involved in running a campaign. You still have to pay for the political ads, the polling data, the staff salaries, among all the other regular campaign expenses. And that's where political donations come in. Donors of the lifeblood of local campaign. But in Maryland, there are usually strings attached if you take someone else's money. Donors see campaign contributions as an investment. 
and they expect a return, like a government job or a contract for their businesses. Over the years, Agnew has heard all the stories and knows this is the system you have to contend with if you want to climb the ladder in elected office. And Agnew does have his sights set high. As he stands on stage, taking the oath of office, he gets a visceral feeling, a tingling in his arms even, knowing that this is just the beginning. From here, the sky's the limit. Because maybe at some point, he'll reach the governor's mansion. Maybe he'll even make it to Washington. And Agnew will do whatever it takes to get there. A few months later, Lester Matz walks through the lobby of an upscale office building in Towson, Maryland. Matz stops to check his reflection in the large gold-framed mirror. His tie is well-knotted, and his charcoal suit looks immaculate. Feeling satisfied with his appearance, Matz knocks on an office door, ready for what could be the most important meeting of his professional life. Matz is an engineer and runs a local firm that deals in large-scale construction projects. But the firm has been struggling to attract new business, and with their finances dwindling, Matz has been trying to find a new source of revenue. One of the most promising options is the lucrative world of government contracting, taking on large municipal projects like bridges and roads. But those contracts always seem to go to the same firms, the one with connections to the right officials. That's partly why Matz began making political donations himself. He even gave $500 to the upstart Republican Spiro Agnew. Matz figured if he could help Agnew pull out a win, it might open some doors. The Baltimore County Executive has the power to award contracts, so Matt saw a campaign donation as an investment in his company's future. And it seems the bet might have paid off. Agnew won the election, and he and his close friend, the real estate developer and bank executive Walter Jones, have agreed to take this meeting, giving Matt's a chance to pitch his construction firm for county projects. Matt steps into Jones's lavish office and notices it's stocked with fine wine and expensive furniture. This is a place of power. So when he takes his seat, he gets right down to business. Well, gentlemen, I'm glad we could sit down for this meeting. I want to show you something. Here. Matt takes out a set of engineering blueprints and lays them on the coffee table. This is a plan for a new bridge that would cross the reservoir. Now, if you were to go with my firm, you'd find we have a level of expertise that... Lester. I appreciate your coming here so prepared. It's good to see. Well, look, I don't need to see plans. Everyone's told me your firm has a reputation for doing great work, so the county would be thrilled to bring you on board for some upcoming projects. Matt sits back in shock. He's been hitting his head against the wall for seven years trying to drum up business. And now, after making a $500 campaign donation, suddenly he's in the big leagues. Well, well, thank you. Um, But aren't, aren't you sure you don't want to at least take a look at some of the plans? I mean, I've got a lot here. Cost estimates, supply procurements, you name it. No, 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 no. That's all okay. You keep them. Uh, I got to run. But Jones here, he can handle the rest. He's one of my oldest and closest friends, and he has my full confidence. Well, okay then. I I guess we'll be in touch. Matt's rises, but when Agnew reaches out for a handshake, he looks Matt's directly in the eye and repeats himself. Now, Lester, remember, Mr. Jones here has my full confidence. Matt snods. That was an unusual phrase to say twice. A moment later, Agnew steps out of the office. But as soon as Jones takes over the conversation, it all starts to make sense. All right, so Lester, let me explain how this is going to work. Now, in Baltimore, if you're a firm and you get a government contract, you usually send back some of the money to the guy who assigned the work. That number is usually 5% of the total value of the contract. Matt swallows. He now realizes the real purpose of this meeting. Agnew is looking for kickbacks. And Jones is his collector. <clears throat> ah, all right. Well, I, I, I'd heard about this, but I didn't know it was uh, a thing that was actually done. Oh, hey, look, don't look so bothered. This is a game in which everyone wins. The county gets roads and bridges. A firm like yours gets the contracts you deserve. And public servants like Mr. Agnew, he gets the funds necessary to cover political expenses. This is all just part of the process. It's how we keep the machine moving. Right, yeah, part of the process. Over the next few minutes, Jones continues explaining Baltimore's process of keeping the machine moving. But slowly, the shock begins to wear off. Matt's just needs to come up with a few grand in cash and keep his mouth shut. Then, overnight, his company will double their revenue. They'll never again have to worry about finances. Government contracts will just start pouring in. And Jones is right. 
As long as Spiro Agnew stays in power and everyone plays their part, it'll be a win-win for everyone in Baltimore County. From Wondery, this is episode one of Spiro Agnew, Downfall of a Vice President from American Scandal. In our next episode, Spiro Agnew rises to the top of American government. Meanwhile, back in Maryland, federal investigators begin digging into political corruption and are shocked by what they uncover. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to American Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus and Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. If you'd like to learn more about Spiro Agnew, we recommend the books White Knight, The Rise of Spiro Agnew by Jules Whitcover, A Heartbeat Away by Richard M. Cohen and Jules Whitcover, The Rise of the Republican Right by Brian M. Conley, and Watergate, A New History by Garrett Graff. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Christian Paraga. Sound design by Molly Bach. Music editing by Katrina Zemrak. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Corey Metcalf. Edited by Christina Malsberger. Produced by Andy Herman. Our senior producer is Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marshall Louie for Wondering.